I thought I'd do first is, yeah, you know, I've had a lot of questions from, from students, and especially most of you are, are burgeoning student leaders. Um, as Houston mentioned, you know, before I came to be the dean, which by the way, I've not even been there for two months yet. It seems longer, but uh, um, I was the assistant secretary of Homeland Security working for Jan Napolitano. Uh, and in the administration, I spent every other Tuesday in a White House situation. Uh, and you'd be surprised what healthcare uh, and physicians get into. Uh, and sometimes that can be Syria, uh, and that was in my portfolio, whether or not the Syrians had used chemical weapons and how we would prove that, um, to H7 and 9, uh, and whether or not that was going to become a pandemic. And, uh, could be crippling and work with the World Health Organization and HHS on that. Um, and so that was a, a pretty interesting time. I, I'll tell you, there was one time when it, when it really struck me how far we've come as a profession was uh, uh, we were in a situation where about a month before I came to DMU, and all the chief medical officers from the big federal agencies were around the table for, with the National Security Advisor, and including FBI, CIA, DHS, uh, HHS, CDC, and uh, DOD. And it turned out, as I looked around the room, uh, sitting beside me was General Doug Robb, who is a now a three-star uh, general, who is also a DO. And so it occurred to me of the eight folks that were in the Situation Room uh, waiting on the President and the National Security Advisor, two of us were DOs. And so I thought, I wonder how many times that's occurred in the past. Uh, none. Uh, so uh, the profession has come a long way. <coughs> We're doing a lot of things. But I thought first, for the first uh, 20 or 30 minutes, uh, most of you, I think, have probably heard my background before uh, going to Homeland Security. I was actually the chief of space medicine at NASA for a decade. Uh, worked with the astronauts, planned the missions, did all the things that uh, we do at NASA, planning uh, astronaut health care, on orbit, et cetera. Uh, and before that, I uh, had multiple other titles, uh, Chief of Aerospace and 22nd Air Force, or Chief of Life Flight, et cetera, et cetera. So I've, I've been in management uh, for almost the entire career that I've, after residency, uh, in one form or another, and I've had Chief in my title about eight times in the last uh, two decades. So from that standpoint, I thought I'd first take some questions from, from folks, and then I thought I'd let you guys drive which presentation so I can either talk about space medicine, or I can talk about homeland security, or I can talk about the Chilean mine rescue. I know which, uh, I've got a couple of votes already on the Chilean mine rescue, uh, which I was also involved in as the consultant, so if most of you remember the Chilean miners that were trapped. Um, it has some interesting physiologic aspects, uh, as well as some leadership aspects to it, which I'll point out uh, if that's the direction we go. But what questions do you have, first of all? And by the way, uh, Non-attribution, uh, so you know, first, uh, as long as my answers aren't on the uh, ABC Morning Show, uh, I'm happy with any question you ask. Just don't ask me, you know, things about the situation in the room or, you know, classified stuff with Syria because I can't go there. So what questions do you have? Somebody's got to ask one. Yes, ma'am. Thanks for starting it off, Tara. Rotating in residency, part of the residency we had, had to do, I rotated at Mount Sinai. 
and we had a, uh, a life flight rotation at Metro. We had to rotate. They had a physician and a critical care nurse that would fly. And I evidently did fairly well on that. And the, uh, to the point where the chief of trauma uh, at Metro said, hey, what do you think about being the chief of life flight? And you would be an ER attending uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and you'd fly around a helicopter on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and you'd manage the calendar and the schedule and the, the budget for life flight. But I've never managed people or a budget or anything else, but the thought of flying from a helicopter, if somebody paid me to do it on Tuesdays and Thursdays appealed to me. So it kind of started off from there. Um, but I will tell you, at least for your careers, you can then start to vector it from there. And so after I started to get, started to get the management bug, um, I decided to formalize it and uh, get extra education. I know you're working on your MPH right now. And, uh, you know, I have two master's degrees. My wife would say neither one has more money. But uh, the first one was a master's in science and space studies uh, with a human factors engineering uh, minor. Because uh, I wanted to go to NASA at some point. Uh, and so I, I kind of vectored it that way and built the CV so that I would have a higher likelihood of getting in. And then the second one was the Master's in Business at USC because I kept, people kept handing me budgets and, and I had no idea how to read a p &L. I kept hearing people say p &L, and it took me about three months to figure out that was profit and loss. And then, you know, that's as much as I knew. And uh, but after, I'll tell you, in medicine though, and we were talking about this earlier, you know, in the 1970s we seeded all of all of healthcare. Uh, if you, I, I call it the uh, the hall of the oil paintings. So my wife was having surgery one time at Methodist in Houston, and I'm pacing up and down the hallway outside of the administration. And if you notice, you know they always have the the oil paintings of all the presidents and CEOs of the big hospitals, and, uh, all these guys in a library somewhere somewhere with their false pose and, and things, and the big oil paintings. And I noticed. You know, 1910, Dr. So-and-so, 1920, Dr. So-and-so, 1930, Dr. So-and-so, 1940, 1950, 1960, Dr. So-and-so, 1970, so-and-so, MBA, 1980, so-and-so, MBA. Uh, anyway, about 1970s, things changed. This thing called managed care came to be. And most physicians said, I got in this business to treat patients. I didn't get in this business to manage care and DRGs and other things. And so we kind of ceded the authority of our hospitals and healthcare in general to folks that were not physicians. Um, and we still have, quite frankly, because uh, I can be board certified in emergency medicine, but I only do emergency medicine 2% of my time. The rest of the time, I am doing management. I can't be board certified in it, not by the AOA or by the ABMS. Um, we need to change that. Otherwise, we'll never be back in the driver's seat. So all of you who take a policy degree or an MHA or et cetera, yeah, at some point, you're going to rise from your practice, whether it's family practice or emergency medicine or surgery, or will be a chief medical officer somewhere, or you know, director of health and human services, or in your case, director of the World Health Organization, or and so, you know, when those things occur, you'd like to still be, you know, board certified. You feel, feel like you're relevant to the quote unquote. Um, and right now we don't allow that or engage physicians in that. And the interesting part is that the MBAs have a, a board. So with the American College of Healthcare Executives, it's called the Board of Governors Exam, that they can take to be board certified in medical management. But we don't have that in either the AOA or the ABMS, not even it's interesting in that respect, and we need to get back to drivers. On the in DC, on the Medicare and Medicaid boards, and most of them are attorneys and MBAs. Very few physicians there. What else you got? Come on, somebody's got to have one question or two. Then we'll start with the other presentation. Because I know you guys want to get out of here before eight o'clock, so that we can get to the AOA reception. Yeah. Um, 
Um, and so in talking with a lot of my classmates who had, you know, not necessarily the same background, but similar ones in different areas, um, we see that it's, it's a challenge uh, to kind of fit anything into the med school curriculum that is kind of outside of just the specific practice of medicine. So we're talking about management, talking about, you know, ARP relations and, and the insurance industry and just healthcare administration as a whole. Um, and do you think that that's something that we should be integrating somehow uh, in our curriculum? And I say that. I do, but I, I think it has to be closer to when you actually, you know, have that experience. So not in your first or second years. How many of you, you know, I know some of the schools have lots of vacation time in the third or fourth years. Some still have six, seven, eight weeks, depending on over those two years. Um, after you graduate, you don't get six, seven, eight weeks. You get two. Uh, so there's a huge transition time. And uh, I would think having a class, uh, whether it's a, you know, a week-long class uh, or what have you in your fourth year before you go out and actually have to worry about what is Medicare, what is Medicaid, what is uh, third-party payer, what is this ACA everybody keeps talking about, how's it going to impact you, and what's the ARRA legislation, why are there all the DOs who don't know how to work in EMR upset about that, and you know, what do those things mean? Um, because they they do change the landscape a great deal. And make no mistake, despite the rancor in Congress, which by the way, there's a lot of kabuki theater. Uh, I'll tell you how things actually work. 22 year olds, 22 and 23 year olds right after the legislation, the staffers. Uh, and you know, John McCain sits there on his Twitter account half the time. The first time I testified before Congress, I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna testify. And you know, the congressmen are there working on the blackberries, and uh, I'm mostly talking to the 22-year-olds that are there, that are actually writing the legislation. And uh, there's a lot of theater that goes on. I had a senator that came up to me and said, Dr. Paul, it's so great to have you here. No, you know, love your work, Homeland Security, this, that, and another. And then, and then the lights come on, and it's, uh, what are you doing? Secure and I'm thinking, what? Well, this guy was telling me he just liked me 10 minutes ago. Then the lights and the cameras go off, and it's like, hey, good job. Hey, thanks. Appreciate your time. And so it let me know that there's the senator that you see in front of the camera, who's, who, by the way, congressman, do you know how, how much money they have to raise every day in order to stay in? Because remember, they're only in for two years. In order to stay in, they have to raise 10 grand a day on average. So, I mean, that, that is their job most of the time. It's raising capital in order to stay there or in order to get a Senate seat, which is their ultimate job, is to move from the House to the Senate, where they can stay for six years. So there's a lot of kabuki theater that goes on, which was, you know, I, I thought it was what I saw. So I'll tell you right now, with all the stuff that we're going through with the government shutdown, a lot of this is over Obamacare, obviously, or the ACA. And so there's there's a little match going forward, back and forth. Uh, whether you like it, you know, the ACA, agree with it or not, it will go forward in some form or fashion. Um, and it'll get tweaked multiple ways. And folks will add amendments to it. Um, because right now it's not financially sustainable. That's what the Republicans are arguing about. But access to care and the, uh, the greater access to care for a larger population is what the Democrats are arguing for. Uh, and so you can probably see they're both right, but God forbid neither either of them actually be the middle way. So it, it'll be very interesting. So I think we will go to a government shutdown tonight. Uh, so I, that's one reason I'm kind of glad I'm not the federal government. <laughs> so um, we'll take one more question, then I'll, I'll, I'll do with uh, folks. Yes, sir. When you're in the Situation Room, you ever did the osteopathic elevator speech to uh, Obama? Did you ever ask the other? No. Um, they were, I will tell you, the things that we dealt with are on a huge scale. And so uh, usually the president doesn't have much time for chit chat. He comes in and this usually what happens is the national security advisor is there first. And wants to know what's what's the bigger story, and then the president's going to come in. He's got six minutes, 
So I need you to give exactly what the deal is on the next topic, whether it's the hurricane or whether it's, you know, what are the prep for FEMA for Hurricane Sandy? Uh, what are we going to do about the uh, H7N9? Or what are we going to do about the Saudi Arabian coronavirus? And the Saudi Arabians may or may not be willing to share sort of data. Uh, and so things of that nature. And so it was fairly straightforward. And yes, sir, and no, sir. So I doubt that he even knew that there were DOs and MPs in the room because of my, my name factor is that Dr. Polk, Chief Medical Officer of Homeland Security. And when you're in there with the uh, CIA and the FBI and some of these, the CIA, by the way, has no sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you can be in there and say, hey, there's two DOs here. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, they, they, they just don't have any sense of humor at the CIA. And I'm not even sure they even use the real names for their little tent card and stuff, so they're an interesting group. Um, but you would be surprised where healthcare is involved. Um, little things. Hurricane Sandy, for example. Um, so you've got 22 teams of electrical technicians from different states who are going to try to restore power. And Craig Fugate looks at you at the round table and says, what's the priorities? So as a physician, what are your priorities for restoring the power? Well, hospitals would be certain number one, right? What's your next priority? Water treatment plan. Wastewater treatment. Wastewater, water pumps. Okay, that's a good public health answer. What about for patients? What's your next one? Could be nursing homes. Tell me what, what patients can go 48 hours without power, or what patients can't go 48 hours without power. How about folks on dialysis? So, dialysis centers are one. So you put those in the next for priorities, which FEMA would not think of, right? They'd be thinking water, they'd be thinking groceries, gas stations. They're thinking, Mass low higher on uh, But we know that folks, when they get hyperkalemic, because they haven't had dialysis in 40 hours, can die. So they're likely to have death escalates after 48 hours. Um, what about asthmatics? Uh, you know, COPDers that have the aerosol machines. So sometimes just setting up and say, you know what, if you set up a gym and you put 100 power strips across the floor, and put 100 aerosol machines across, and we'll move in a crate of albuterol, you'll probably prevent uh, maybe 100 admissions for the hospital. Because otherwise, you know, all the COPD years and everybody else will jam pack in the ER. Um, although we have pegylated insulin now, it used to be, you know, folks that had to refrigerate their insulin, that was a bad now. Although some folks still use horses and other things. So you would have little things like that. We would get uh, a report back that said that there were 12 deaths from carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, because people would be burning, uh, you know, it's cold after, after the Hurricane Sandy and then the temperature dropped and it got really cold. And so people were burning their gas stoves or their fuel oil stoves uh, in their homes with the house. And so we were about to deploy 2,400 FEMA trailers. Well, what's the one little instrument you'd like to have for 2,400? carbon monoxide detector. They all had smoke detectors, but they had to put a CO detector. Because uh, usually hurricanes occur in the summer, and people are in temporary housing in the summer, and that's not an issue. And so, you know, the nice thing about with Craig Fugate in his suit, say, or, or with his folks, I, we need to put carbon monoxide detectors in there. We've had 12 tests and 20 admissions for carbon monoxide. And they said, okay, how quickly can we put 2,400 what do they cost? Well, they're about seven bucks a piece, and they're at Walmart. All right, we'll buy them all, you know, and the batteries. And so you actually end up saving folks. Uh, but, you know, little things like that where medicine enters into the equation that you didn't think about. So, on that note, uh, I think I'll switch gears and go to the Chilean mine disaster because that one also points out several things that all of you all have learned in medical school. Um, I can say safely that it's not rocket science because I also have a degree in rocket science and I know rocket science. <laughs> so 
I'll, uh, I'll switch gears for a second, and we'll pull this up. We'll see if, if my Andy talents. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, obviously, I'm no longer with NASA, but I was the Chief of Space Medicine and the Deputy Chief Medical Officer of NASA. So that's former. No longer Homeland Security. So that's, that says current, but it was former. And then this is the only thing you guys are going to remember after this. Is you, most of you won't even remember that that was the dean of DMU. It's just that back from out of town, I was really smart and had lots of slides. So that's accepted. Um, let me tell you how this came about initially. So most of you know Chile is in the Ring of Fire. You know what the Ring of Fire is? Ring of Fire is that tectonic plate through the Pacific that has the earthquakes and the volcanoes uh, through the Pacific, through Japan, through Chile, through uh, California, etc. Um, and Chile had a very large earthquake of about 7.2 uh, March before this collapse. And it loosened this large amount of rock, but it didn't fall yet until months later in the traffic miners. And so what happened was then, you know, this massive, huge amount of rock falls into the mine, which, by the way, I'll, I'll show you how much rock it is. We're talking like 600,000 tons. This isn't like they were going to dig themselves out kind of thing. They'd still be there digging. Um, and the Chileans thought this was a body recovery. Because, quite frankly, after a lot of mine collapse, it is a body recovery. In fact, most of them in the U.S., they are a mine, a mine you know, or body recovery. Um, and so they were digging down, trying to drop down into the mine uh, with a plomo, uh, which is about four inches around, trying to poke into the mines themselves. And this is at about day 17. And eventually they broke through and they thought they saw something on the camera. They put a camera down in the whole pipe. And then they felt a tub on the camera. And so they pulled it up, and this was the note that they saw on the end. It was taped to the side, which says, we are alive in the refuge of 33. That's the president of Chile that's holding the note. So two things go through your mind at that time. First, you know, hooray, they're alive. And then secondly, oh crap, they're alive. Because um, they're buried under 2,400 feet of solid rock. And by the way, up until this rescue, the longest time that anyone had survived alive in a mine after a collapse was 19 days, and we're at day 17. And so the uh, ambassador from Chile uh, came across from DC to NASA and asked NASA if NASA would help collapse. Well, why NASA? Well, the president of Chile is actually a millionaire entrepreneur. And he asked, right, who are the two people that keep people alive in an enclosed space for a prolonged period of time? Well, there's two people, the, the Navy and NASA. And so he asked for our help because of that. So these folks, there's 33 of them. And by the way, all 33 are not miners. Only half of them are miners. The rest of them were guys that drive the trucks through the mine, bring the load up, or, or do loading, et cetera. They weren't the guys that actually did the digging. There's, their ages range from 19 to 62. The 19-year-old was on the job one day, his first day in the mine. He'd never been in the mine before, before that. His life really sucked. <laughs> All right, the known medical conditions are type 2 diabetes, silicosis, hypertension, coronary disease, and COPD. And this is what it looked like. So, if you see on the lower left inset, you know, there's a zigzag pattern. And the zigzag pattern is because you've got to drive all that ore up. And so it can, it's got about a 30 degree grade, and it goes back and forth so that you can bring all the ore up. Uh, and this was a gold and copper mine, which is a very important thing. So it's a 100 year old gold and copper mine. And initially, when we got consulted, I thought, this, you know, when I think of a mine, I thought like a small cave that everybody was in. And actually, it was, you know, this is the amount of run that they have. It's 
about a quarter or a half mile. So there's, there's a lot of room there for them to maneuver. So there are two things about you know, why we benchmark or why they benchmark with NASA and the Navy. What most of you don't know, which some of you can look up on your computers or Google, is that NASA had a rescue plan for the Hubble missions, which was called the STS-400 mission. It never flew. But after Columbia exploded uh, over the skies of Texas, unfortunately with uh, seven of my friends on board, and I was in mission control when that occurred, uh, taking care of the space station crew, in order for us to fly again, uh, especially for the Hubble mission, which is much further up, we had to devise a rescue plan for setting another shuttle up to rescue the astronauts that might be stranded. The Navy, you know, of course, with down subs, that's another thing that they would benchmark figure out how they would get those folks out. One of the biggest things that they did, which is something that you need to learn in leadership as well, is when you have a crisis, you need to flatten the leadership chain. They made it very flat. They didn't have to go to boards and committees to get anything approved. Uh, it went from me to the Minister of Health to the President uh, when we got things done. So it was a very flat leadership change. And that, that's something that you want to have. You want recommendations by phase because it can be really overwhelming. So think of like a job, you know, when you have a tornado or a disaster. There's the recovery phase, there's the immediate acute phase, there's all the phases in between. And so you don't want to have the same person in charge of all of those because it's very overwhelming and taxing to try to think about it and break it down into all those pieces. And so we broke this down for the Chileans into the rescue, the initial incident phase, the survival phase, sustainment phase, rescue phase, and then the rescue and reintegration phase. So, 600,000 tons of rock collapsed in the mine, but two things killed the majority of mine victims. Yeah? Austin? Asphyxia, that's for sure. What else? Trauma? Trauma, yeah, you hit me standing underneath the 600,000 tons, right? So trauma and asphyxiation. They didn't asphyxiate because this was a hundred-year-old golden copper mine, so it was kind of leaky because it had been mined a lot. And they didn't have glass pressure for the same reason. Uh, normally, if you had 600,000 tons of rock suddenly falling into the mine, they would displace a lot of air and you would get glass pressure. And if you were going to go to the ER and you were going to triage people, who had glass pressure? What's the one question you would ask? How close were you? No. Can you hear? Why? Because there's a change in air pressure. And air-filled structures like your gut, your middle ear, get ruptured, and your alveoli. So most of us have learned about burns, right? That if somebody was in a burn or smoke, and they've got burns around their lips or, or nose, you know that pretty soon they're going to become the Michelin man. You've got to innovate them now before they swell. Same thing. If somebody's in a blast and you say, can you hear, and they can't hear you, what's going to happen to them? Other than the fact they can't hear Their alveoli start to fill with fluid and they go into ARDS. So usually in about two hours after the blast. So that's kind of the same thing, much like you got the smoke or inhalation stuff around, around and soot around the mouth, and you know you gotta innovate somebody in the fire. If you have somebody in a blast over pressure and they blow their eardrums, you know you have about two hours before they desaturate, and they're gonna be up there to try to ventilate and oxygenate the vent. So first, what the press didn't know is that the miners saved themselves. So 17 days before they were found, you know, 17 days until they were found. Uh, what's the rule of threes in survival? Do you know the rule of threes? In the military you learn, you gotta have three hours to find shelter, three days to get water, and three weeks for food. They're well beyond three days, right, for water. They dug wells. You know, if I go back to that one slide where you saw the inset, the miners were 2,400 feet down, but they weren't 2,400 feet below sea level. The miners were actually at sea level. 
The entrance to the mine is 2,400 feet up. The mine is in the mountains. So the leader of the mine, the guy at the center uh, of the crew, said, all right, we don't have enough water, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to break up into groups of good love. Again, good leadership. He kept everybody busy. This 11 is going to dig a, a well. This 11 is going to dig a well. This 11 is going to dig a well. I want you to drink from that well. I want you to drink from that well. I want you to drink from that well. We'll see if you get set. Simple triage. First 11, dug the well, drank, they got set. Second 11, dug the well, drank, they got set. Third group of 11, dug the well, drank, they get set. Everybody drank from that well. So they had to clean well water. So they essentially saved themselves. Then they divided up the rations. And by the way, the rations were meant for the initial miners, not all the people in transit that were going up and down. And so they had cans of tuna, cans of peaches, and some powdered dried milk. So the miners had one teaspoon of tuna, one quarter of a peach, and a teaspoon of milk every other day. You ever looked at the back of the tuna, the sun kissed package? How much, how many calories there is, there are? So I've got to use the proper English, my wife will kill me. There are for that. This is like only 100 calories in that whole packet. So imagine what's a, what's a teaspoon every other day? How many calories do you think they have? Yeah, maybe 50 on a good day. Um, and so were they starving? Absolutely. They were definitely starving. And, you know, we finally have a Paloma in the streets. And the, the Paloma is like, Think of a plastic pipe like you have in your sprinkler system. It's about four inches round, only it's, it's metal. Uh, and it goes all the way down to the shaft where they are. And you can set a torpedo down, this little torpedo, but it only, it can only be about six feet long and four inches around because, because it, since it goes through solid rock, it's a little wobbly. And so it'll get stuck if it's any longer than six feet. And so you stuff whatever you can in. So if you're about to send food down, what's your initial concern? The people that have been starving. What is it? Okay, you don't want them to overeat, but what, what's the other thing we're doing? What is it? Refeeding syndrome. So when you're starving, what happens? What's your body do? You use up your liver glycogen, right? You start to feed off your fat initially, which we all like initially, because we think, oh, man, that's so much better. Uh, and then when you start to break down, your muscle, you have down regulation of insulin, your brain switches to ketones, right? So what's the big deal about that? Why, why don't I start shoving Twinkies and Popos down the balloon? What's the main electrolyte disturbance that we feed these It's, most people would think potassium. It's actually phosphorus. What do your cells run? ATP, it is a triphosphate. And so if I give you a surge of glucose, I need carbohydrate initially instead of protein or fat. Uh, you have a spike in insulin. Phosphorus comes out of the cell into your bloodstream, and your cells no longer have enough phosphorus for ATP. And so you actually don't die of electrolyte uh, cardiac dysrhythmia like you would with potassium. You die of CHF. You have heart failure. Because your cardiac muscles start to pump as much. How do we know about this stuff? How do we know about refeeding? How did we learn about it? Yeah, we killed people in concentration camps without being to. So in World War II, 19-year-olds come across Auschwitz and concentration camps and things like that, and they see these emaciated walking skeletons. And what's a 19-year-old want to do when he sees an emaciated walking skeleton? Feed them. And what do the GIs have on them? These K rations with Hershey bars and all this stuff. And so that's what they gave them. And they actually killed a bunch of people. It's a very unfortunate in that respect. So what are the other electrolytes concerned? Potassium and magnesium. Think about it this way. Do you know what we give for uh, for hyperkalemia? What is it? Well, it's one. What's what's the old trick? We used to get three 
things. Oh, come on, Tyler knows. Insulin, bicarb, glucose. Right? Those are three things you give somebody that's hyperkalemic that has a really high potassium. Well, if we give somebody carbohydrate, that's glucose, right? And what happens to their insulin? It shoots up, as it was down right here. So now we've got two out of three. And the food is alkaline compared to what they are, their acidotic. So essentially, you just gave that patient insulin, bicarb, and glucose. So the potassium dives down as well. Thiamine is the other one that we worry about. That's the vitamin of concern. Because remember, we used up liver glycogen. So, you know, NASA actually worked with the plants to make sure that we fed the miners protein initially uh, to make sure we didn't get refeeding. Now imagine you're a miner though, and you've been starving. You've been eating a teaspoon of tuna every other day, and you're waiting at the Paloma, and down comes Insure. Yeah, not exactly what you were looking for. <laughs> and so the Chilans, because they were smart about this, they actually ended up saving them again. Not a single one went to heart failure. Not a single one had hyperkalemia or hypokalemia. So no hypokalemia, no hypophosphatemia, no cardiac dysrhythmias, no cardiac failure, and no cardiac arrest. Their usual rule, and we still see refeeding syndrome, by the way. You'll see it in neuro patients. So think about the alcoholic who's got very poor nutrition, who falls down and smacks their head. And now they're in the ICU, they've had a subdural, and you do the subdural thing, and you're going to start feeding them TPN. This is the one that you have to worry about to make sure that they have phosphorus in their TPN. And the usual rule is to go low and go slow. So you start out at 1,000 calories and 1,500, then 2,000, then 2,500, et cetera. And that's actually what we gave them. So if you look at Insure Plus, you can see how much potassium, how much phosphorus, and how much magnesium is in there. And then we switched eventually to support tan down below. Why do you think we switched to support tan?
fancy part was we did this with, you know, as we ramp up, fortunately, you know, we didn't have to worry about CO2 going up or O2 consumption because of the, the mines nice and leaky, but we still had to worry about the refeedings you know, to make sure that they did well. And then we talked about neurosurgical patients being the ones that would get this. So the mine's 90 degrees and 90% humidity, right? The miners are sleeping on hot rocks. Remember, it's, they're not 2,400 feet below sea level, they're at sea level. So it's actually hot in the mine. And they're sleeping on hot rocks because there, there are no beds down there that we didn't expect them to be trapped. So what's, what are the consequences of sleeping on hot rocks and feeding off your own muscle and dehydration? Rapid, yeah. So rapid myelitis. You break down your own muscle, the huge muscle proteins bombard the kidney, and you get kidney failure. So a urine dipstick is actually the first test result. Not doesn't sound very fancy, not very expensive, but think about it. You can it tells specific gravity, right? So you can tell if they're still dehydrated. It gives you ketones, so you can tell if they're still starving. And there's, there's a problem with the dipsticks. It's a problem when you're in an emergency position. But in this respect, it actually worked well for us. Your dipsticks can't tell the difference between myoglobin and hemoglobin. It looks the same. They'll come out positive for blood. And so we went out on a limb and decided probably all the miners weren't having a kidney stone at the same time, which was true. 50% of the miners tested positive for myoglobin. And then we did blood work on them. There was actually one medic among all the 33 that we sent out the blood tubes. And they had elevated the UN and gravity. So they're on the verge of acute tubular necrosis because of gravity. So, oh, going too fast. So we targeted those folks for five liters of water a day in consumption. I essentially had them peeing like racehorses, drinking like racehorses. Uh, and lo and behold, they all cleared. But she'll have problems, she'll sleep on the hot rocks, right? This is where the president got released from. So that's what the Paloma looks like, the little bell tube that's four inches around. The Paloma, you know, the president decided, and this is where leadership comes in again. He sends out a press wire. Because you know, now all the press is focused on this, right? You got all the press is he sends it out through the press wire that he needs cots. And he wants 18 cots. And he wants them by 48 hours. And oh, by the way, they can't exceed six feet long or four inches round. So you have to be able to get out the plumb. Now you would think that's insane. You have three companies that sent him test cots. And so within 48 hours, we had cops to send down, and they hot, you know, they were able to sleep on the racks. And we had we split them up into shifts. That's why 18 instead of 33 cops. So you had a day shift and a night shift uh, working. So they actually had to clear the rock from the mine up above because you had drills coming down that were hopefully going to rescue. And then this is the next thing the president did. It looked like the drilling was going to take too long. They weren't going to get out until December, maybe even Christmas. We're in September. And he said, you know what? You know what works really well to motivate folks? Competition. And so I'm going to ask the Americans and the Europeans to send down drilling crews. And so I don't know if you can see behind me, but there are three on that whiteboard. There are the three drills. And guys would run across to see where the Americans were, or where the Europeans were, or where the Slams were. And a competition, the Americans won, by the way. I really won. But that cut the time down almost in half. Uh, and we were able to get you know, a, lot, a lot of competition going. People had multiple different, you know, because they're drilling through solid rock, right? So you, you break a blade pretty often. And they're still replacing them. So great brainstorming on this part of the president, again, from his leadership standpoint. Folks were worried from a medical standpoint, but you know, 
What about, uh, what about latrines and how to go to the bathroom and where they filthy and this and that? How do you cool a drill that's drilling through hot rock? A lot of water. And the drill follows a pilot hole. So you have a pilot hole that's about four inches around that's following. And you are cooling the drill with a massive amount of water. So that heat, which gets up to several hundred degrees uh, from the drill, what's it do to the water? Sterilizes it. And then it comes through solid rock. They had essentially three hot showers that were running. And then the water, of course, you saw the zigzag. The miners weren't at the very bottom of the mine. They still had another you know, quarter of a mile to go. So they dug you know, little trenches where they would go to the bathroom and all that water would just take it down to the end of the mine. So they actually we sent down soap, they had shampoo, they had new clothes, they had all the stuff. Amazing things. By the way, they made PowerPoint projectors. They're less than four inches round and about six inches long. So they were able to watch the soccer game uh, projected on the wall. So you can see they're starting to look a little bit better than they were. Still looking a little on the skinny side, they look a little bit better. And then we start, you know, one of the things you have to think about is to make sure you've got a contingency. You know, what, what if Joplin gets destroyed and two weeks later there's another tornado in Joplin? So you want to make sure you're always planning for the what ifs. And so we did that as well. Okay, from a medical standpoint, you got a patient with type 2 diabetes who's been down the mine. And he was on metformin prior to this accident. Well, when would you begin setting that down? Or would you start feeding? What do you think? Anybody? Anybody? You what? You wouldn't want to treat because the stores are gone already. Right, right. So I went out on a limb and said that he was diet control. What's the main physiologic concern with metformin? By the way, this is on your boards. Yeah, exactly. Lactic acidosis. And they're already asked out, right? So, you know, until they get over their starvation, so you don't want to make them more lactic acidosis. This is why you need to think about your clinical practices as well. Everything that looks like eczema is not eczema. And so the Chilean said, you know, he, he keeps sending down steroid pain. These guys have got eczema. Can't figure out what the deal is. Mm -hmm. It wasn't eczema, it was linoleic acid deficiency because of their nutritional status. So once we replaced the linoleic acid deficiency, the eczema went away. They had herpes virus, latent virus activation, as you know, anybody does in a high stress situation sometimes. Immunization, a lot of folks were wondering, oh my god, you're gonna immunize them and give them Influenza, DPT, and tetanus and things. So, you know, it's dirty down in the mine. Remember, they had three hot showers, they had soap, they had stuff. It's probably, they're probably cleaner down there than they were on the surface at the given time. You had things like breakouts of uh, HPV and, uh, you know, the HPV. You had the normal things for constipation, respiratory infections, et cetera, dental caries. Alcohol and tobacco. So, as a good DO, I said, you know, no alcohol, right? Because they've already, what, you know, they're already thiamine deficient, right? And alcohol would decrease that. And then I said, no smoking, because that would be bad in mine, right? And then Al Holland, the psychologist who was with me, leaned forward and said, they will kill each other. <laughs> and so I had to give in on that a little bit. So they sent down a couple of cigarettes in a minute, just so we didn't get Psychological support. We did that, and they had a little telephone so that they could talk to their families on the weekends. This was one that I had a lesson for. Were they at risk for decompression sickness? No, because they're at sea level. But unfortunately, when the press asked this guy at Harvard, I don't think he knew that they were at sea level. So it said in big, bold, 50 font on CNN.com. Miners at risk for the bends, according to Dr. Sean Zodhar. Um, note to self, when you are then talking to the New York Times reporter, you don't say, the guy from Harvard is whacked. Uh, or at least you say, off the record, the guy from Harvard is whacked, because then they print 
the chief of space medicine says the guy from Harvard is whacked. <laughs> So I had to go back to charm school. We do a public affairs course at NASA. I had to go back again. <laughs> so when you're in a, in a cave or in a mine, you multiply it by 3.3 feet of seawater. And that's how you figure out you know, whatever their depth is to figure out if there is for the So anything beyond 17 feet typically is when you start to work. So think about swimming pool times two. We know a few things about Boyle's Law at NASA, obviously, because that's the work environment. We always have to de denitrogenate our folks all the time. So now, guys, you, you got to contemplate the rest of you. What, one of the things that's going to limit your rescue, by the way, is the width of the drill, right? The width of the drill bit is 26 inches wide, which means anything you send down to bring them back up can be no long, you know, no wider than 26 inches. So you're going to contemplate the rest of it. What are the things you got to worry about? 2,400 feet in a cage standing like this. What do you have to worry about? You ever seen 19 year olds lock their knees on a parade ground? Right? They pass out. What's that called? Orthostatic hypertension. Right? All the blood runs through their feet. A little problem with that. Normally, if all the you lie down, you're miraculously, the blood runs you know, back to your heart and brain. But if you are in a cage and you can't lie down, what happens if blood can't get back to the right heart and you have an empty chamber? And it's going to still keep beating, and then when the blood pressure gets low enough, it's not going to fill. It's called preload. And if you don't have preload, you have an empty chamber, what happens? You die. So, they are at risk of death from orthostatic hypertension. That's one of the first things to worry about. What else are they at risk for? What would you be at risk for coming up in a very narrow tube with solid rock, and it's kind of dark, and you're like 2,400 feet? Yeah, a little you know, anxiety reaction maybe. But also, you know, if you get if you get stuck and you've only got the oxygen right here in that cage or the CO2 ability right there in that cage. Uh, because you know the gravel can get loose and the, the thing can get stuck. Imagine that. I mean that would be that would be freaked out. So how do we combat those things? Well, actually, NASA had the same stuff. I mean, we didn't worry about the folks freaking out. But, you know, when you're in space, all the fluid shifts north to your heart and brain. And then you have to worry when you come back into 1G that the blood didn't all rush to your feet and you pass out. It's going to be really bad if the shuttle commander passes out of the top of the stick. So we have a compression garment. So we did the same thing for the miners. They actually had a jokes garment that was underneath their clothes that went from Back down to their ankles. We gave them salt tablets. What do salt tablets do? Fluids follow salt, right? Water follows salt. That's why we use sand. So it increases the plasma volume, increases preload. So when you give salt tablets and then you give them fluid, it stays in the vascular space long. It doesn't get absorbed by the cell, it stays in the venous space. And we gave them sunglasses for UV protection. You see that on the visor for the astronaut's helmet. Uh, and of course, the Chilean miners got Oakley sunglasses, which were really cool. Mm -hmm. Oakley was no stranger to marketing, for sure. <laughs> so we gave fluid load. We gave them five salt tablets, 500 milligram salt tablets, and 40 ounces of water, based on their weight. Their weight. This was a unique thing. So this is the CAD drawing that I worked on down in Chile down to mine, I sent back to my colleagues at NASA. And the nice thing about NASA is they're kind of funky about that stuff. They, they look at your CAD drawings, of course they improve them and they change them, and then they put it into a 3D printer. Have you ever seen a 3D printer? So a 3D printer doesn't print ink, it prints other materials, and it does it in a 3D fashion. So they could actually make a 3D model of this cage within a couple of hours. That's important for you in medicine here coming up because
because 3D printers are going to revolutionize medical care. Uh, eventually, well, they're looking at research to actually, instead of spraying plastic to build a model, to spray cells. So you can do a 3D kidney at some point. So it's really going to change things in the next decade. That's what the mine actually looked like on the right. They had a bell cage on the top, because some of it was loose there. We did a couple things. We put uh, telemetry in, so you could have EKG, you had red pulse ox. We also had a two-way camera, so you can see and hear them. And then we did something else, which was kind of unique. So if you look at it on the left, we worried about it getting trapped. And so it actually had a trap door at the bottom. You had two releases. And if you notice, the miners were in harnesses when they got out. And that's so that they could actually repel back into the mine in case it got stuck, so that they wouldn't have a problem with the orthostatic. But we didn't build the capsule. The president, again, great leadership thing. How would it look if the United States, you know, the drill busted through? How would it look if the United States also made the capsule? How, how would you feel as the Chileans? Would you feel like you rescued your folks when the United States came and rescued your folks? So they did a competition. We did the requirements. We built all the requirements and sent the requirements out for the capsule. And guess who won the design contest? The Chilean Navy was so cool. So they actually built the capsule to our specifications. There are a couple other things with that. You can't, it's not represented in the drawing on the left, but the wheels are actually tilted about 10 degrees. Those, those wheels on the top and the bottom are on springs so that the ride wouldn't be that horribly bumpy. They're tilted just ever so slightly. Why? Exactly. It would turn slowly. And so what's that do to the inside of that cave, of that little cave that come up? Sands it, right, each time. So if you notice, the miners, the first time, it took about 25 minutes to get somebody up. And then it took 20 minutes. And then it took 16 minutes. And then 14 minutes. And then 12 minutes. And then 10 minutes. Each time it got faster and faster. And it's because they were using the capsule actually to help sand the, uh, the actual surface. NASA engineering. We also told them to put the helicopters because you know the second or the first day of NASA is aeronautics, so we have to worry about those things. Six Sigma, we were very Six Sigma about things. What six, what is six, six Sigma? You'll hear about that quality of mine. It's one error in how many? You know, if you had, think about your Toyotas rolling off the line. Toyota uses Six Sigma, Honda uses Six Sigma. When you buy one, you don't want you know every fifth one to break, right? You want to have a high quality. So that's why you have the robotics and lasers building your cars and doing all these things. Well, you know, three defects per million is six sigma. And so what they did is they took everybody to the triage tent and they gave them IV fluids. They treated them exactly the same so they didn't miss anything. This is where they probably didn't do so hot. Was we told them that you know, the folks who were going to experience depression and post-traumatic stress. And they said, you know, when the guys came out, they were on Letterman, they went to Disney World, they were running the New York Marathon. Like, you guys are so off on this one. Well, after all the press goes away and all the lights come off, then you're kind of with your demons. Still to this day, 50% of them are on antidepressants. And nobody has returned to a mine. There's a surprise. Uh, but you know, they're still struggling a great deal with employment. Now, let me back up a little bit. How do you think we combated anxiety? Did we give them Valium or Ativan? How do you think we did? Yeah, exactly. How many of you have kids? When you go to grandma's house, what do your kids say from the back seat? Are we there yet? What do you tell them? Almost, right? You lie out your teeth. <laughs> you say, almost there? So, same thing apply. Okay, you're at 2,000 feet, 1,500 feet, 1,000 feet, almost there. 500 feet, put your sunglasses on. 
smile for the camera at CNN. And then you're out. So that's how we can add an anxiety, because we didn't want to drop the blood pressure with Adam or anything else. Now that worked, by the way, for 32 out of 33 of the minors. One minor, the guy that had the new wife and two girlfriends, I think he got more anxious because we got done soon. <laughs> so, in conclusion, you know, if you do well, by the way, you get to go see this guy. But a lot of physiology went in behind this, but also a lot of leadership went in behind this, and tactics and leadership. And so all of you have all of these same substrates. None of this was rocket science, even though NASA got involved in it. All of it is stuff that you've learned in the medical school. It's, you know, refeeding. It's RQ, the respiratory quotient, and to make sure that you don't give somebody too much carbohydrate if they're starving, and things of that nature. Uh, and a lot of it is leadership. Basics of leadership. How, is, how are the Chileans going to feel about this if the U.S. saved them? alone, or how do we flatten the leadership chain in a crisis, or how do we break things up in a big catastrophe or crisis. So there are lots of leadership lessons here as well. These are things that you need to carry with you as you go through your careers. A lot of it is not rocket science. A lot of it is just managing people and expectations and setting out a plan. You'll find that when people are starved for leadership, that's the best place to go. Most of you think that when you're going to go look for a job, you want to go to a place like Google, right, that has everybody or just taking naps and nap pods and everybody's really happy and fun and it's, it's really fun. That's, you want to go to a place that's challenging. You want to go to a place that's had a lot of adversity and problems in the past. Because then if you have a vision at all, and an ounce of leadership, guess what happens? They follow you. And that's one of the things you want to look for. You want to look for the challenges of leadership where you're going to go. Uh, don't always look for, you know, if you went in with great ideas and innovation, and they were humming and doing really well, what are they going to say? Great, Junior, why don't you sit down? We're doing really well. Yeah, appreciate your ideas. We'll, we'll consider this someday. Love you, hugs and kisses. So, you know, whereas if you go into a place where they're like, oh my God, we've got no leadership here, this has been starving, things have been in turmoil, etc., that's where you say, oh, great, I'm coming to town. And I'm going to set up a plan. And even if it's not a great plan, even if it's a mediocre plan, what do they say? Outstanding, at least somebody's got the plan. And uh, so think about that as well. Don't, as you start through your careers, don't turn away from things that look like large challenges, because they can actually just be large opportunities. And you know, the Chinese Kennedy has a quote that the, uh, there are two characters that describe crisis in Chinese, and you know, one of them means uh, a disaster, and the second means opportunity. And so think of all those things as opportunities. Thanks for letting me come. You have any questions? Made it on time. See, I told you I could do that. <laughs> Shit, but uh, no, I'll show you again. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about your career? How did you actually get to work for NASA? Good question. The, so how did I get to work for NASA? The, I was in the ER and flying for life flight, and I also joined the Air Force Reserve. And my reserve duty was to go um, since, since I flew in a helicopter for a living in the emergency department, um, the Air Force said, well, you must be pretty good at that, so why don't you fly in a helicopter for us, too? And so I did medevac missions and rescue missions for the Air Force, and I was with the rescue squad. And part of our missions were to go and support shuttle launches and landings. Uh, at the Cape, it was really tough duty, so I'd have to deploy and go sit in a uh, barracks out on the beach in, Cal in uh, Florida and wait for the shuttle launch. And sometimes it would get scrubbed from the weather, so I'd be stuck on the beach for six days. It's tough. That served my country. So, um, and I, I kind of got the bug at that point, because you get to meet all the NASA flight surgeons. You get all the medical records from the astronauts in case you have to pick them up. Uh, and one of the things that you do is you clear the box, which is you know, when the solid rocket boosters fall into the ocean, you don't want them to fall on a boat, so you go out and you, Make sure there are no boats out there. 
because you have to fly by the shuttle on the pad uh, multiple times during the launch day. And then you sit out and you watch. You are the closest to the shuttle launch of anybody in case you have to go and rescue. And I thought, that is really cool. Uh, and after about four or five launches and landings that I supported in the Air Force, the flight surgeons at NASA said, you know, you're not bad at this. What? We got an opening at NASA. What do you think about coming down? No problem with that. In the emergency department, I was attending, right? I'm already an assistant professor. I'm already making 210,000 a year. NASA, federal government, I would be starting at the bottom, and I was going to make 130,000 a year. Explain to your wife at that point <laughs> that this is really cool, <laughs> and you would like to take an 80 grand pay cut and move to Texas. And by the way, the first thing that NASA does, you don't become instantly the NASA flight surgeon with the blue flight suit. NASA's smart about how they do it. Initially, you work for a contractor that NASA has. And the first job that you have is going back and forth to Russia. Because for the space station, they train 50% you know, of the time in Russia and 50% in the US. So my first duty was to actually support the astronauts in Russia. And I thought I was going to be able to uh, you know, train in Houston. The, the goal was initially I was going to train in Houston for six months, go through six months of language classes, and then I would deploy to Russia. And my, my poor wife was going to move in a month down with the two kids and the dog and all of our furniture down in Houston. This is where life comes in. So first of all, you know, I, I took the leap, took the 80 grand pay cut, decided that, you know what, this is something I want to do, so we're going to do it. Unfortunately, I had a spouse that said, okay. And we had just built and finished the nice attending house, you know, the one with the nice shrubs and the stuff, and, you know, the really, in the fancy lights out in the, in the landscape and all that nice stuff. So we were about to give all that up. And the guy before me, who's covering Russia, quit. So NASA said, hey, <laughs> <laughs> we got this great idea. Um, we're going to send you to Russia now. And by the way, you can learn Russian when you're there. <laughs> By the way, Russians, not a lot, not a lot of them speak English. And, uh, by, and when you go to the grocery, they don't have English labels there. So uh, I learned Russian, trust me. Uh, but it was a nice little hierarchy of needs Russian. Like, uh, where is the sugar? Where is the bathroom? Where is this? Where is that? Um, by the way, pichin is liver in Russian. A pichinya is cooking. So, <laughs> When you go to winter survival and they ask, would you like pigeon for dinner? And you think it's a cookie. And you say, actually, I buy pigeon at every meal. <laughs> they think, I'll get a cookie with every meal. And the Russians are like, really? Yeah. So for two weeks during winter survival, I ate nothing but liver. <laughs> because I was too arrogant to learn the rest of the language well enough. By the way, I, I think my vitamin B6 and B12 is still through. <laughs> but the biggest thing for the career and how I ascended in all of it was I wasn't afraid to take the lead. The door would open and I would think, okay, let's try it. What's the worst that can happen? And uh, after I got to NASA and I kept working my way up, I became the chief of medical operations operations and the chief of space medicine and then became the boss and yeah, that's how it happened over time and then after the shuttle program retired and you know I got to know the White House because I was the chief of space medicine and also because of the Chelan mine thing they wanted to make sure they didn't kill 33 miners and, yeah it was it was a good thing when I finally when they all got out and the president was very happy about that uh, and so then so they had my name Rolodex. And so then after the shuttle program retired and NASA started to contract, they asked if I would come and be the principal deputy assistant secretary of Homeland Security, which I did. And again, it was a move to DC, which is twice as expensive as Houston, and no pay raise. 
because the federal government, you don't, you, you get to a certain level, you can never make more than the, the vice president of the United States, by the way, uh, the federal government. So the vice president makes 220000 so you will always be below that. And so I said yes, made the leap. And then Janet Napolitano told me in March that she's going to leave uh, and go to academia. So I knew about two months before the press did. Uh, and I thought, hmm, this might be a nice time for me to go back to academia. Uh, and I, I told folks this morning, I'm sure if you're at the lecture this morning, it was, it was actually Marty Levine's fault. Because Marty Levine pointed out when I was lecturing at uh, one of the COLA events that I was the highest ranking DO in the federal government which I was as an assistant secretary. By the way, the Surgeon General of the United States reports to an assistant secretary. So from a rank standpoint, I outranked the Surgeon General of the United States. Most people don't realize that. Um, and that bothered me. You wouldn't think that would bother me. But I got enough, I got enough trophies and certificates and crap on the wall. I don't, I don't need any more stuff on the wall. What bothered me was, what am I doing to create other leaders so I'm not the only top guy in the federal government in the House of Republicans. And uh, so I told my wife, I said, do you want it? It's time for another change. All right, we'll see which medical school needs a dean here for the next six months. And I no sooner said that than two days later there's the advertisement for the Boyne University and the recruiter called. So uh, that's why when I went to uh, dinner, yeah, when I went to dinner with you, I didn't say a word. You notice that? <laughs> See, I can't keep a secret. That's, that's why you know, when you have security clearance, you have to keep it a secret. So, any last parting thoughts? Yeah. Okay, one more question. Before we go, uh, since you know, we're all leaders here, what are some of the key um, traits that you think a leader has? Key traits. One, I think you have to be believable. If, if you tell folks that you're going to do something and they don't believe you, they, they think you're just full of fluff. Um, the other one is you have to understand no is, the word no is temporary. So if the financial analyst or the budgetary or CFO says, no, we can't do that, what that really means is, no, you need to go figure out a way to raise the capital so we can do that. Uh, whereas most people in the medical school say, well, John said we can't have the money to put August out in the United Lab. Well, no, what John said is he doesn't have the money to do that. You need to go figure it out and either raise the endowment or the capital, et cetera. And I think that's where a lot of people fail is you also have to figure out what motivates you folks. There isn't anybody that puts their pants on in the morning and thinks, I'll do a really crappy job today. But some people are motivated by other things. Some, you know, your basic science folks, maybe they just want credit for the fact that they've done stats on 50 different papers and no one's given them applause for them. Um, maybe the anatomy guys just want uh, you know, to put CT and MRI in and be thought of as you know, relevant and doing some cool things. You have to figure out what motivates folks. And then don't micromanage them. Um, and then probably one of the biggest things, which I think is the hardest for most leaders to do, you have to be willing to let people fail. Because sometimes they learn more by failing and picking themselves up and doing it again. And what most of us do is if we see a project going awry, what do we do? We think, ah, uh, uh, yeah, let me, let, me, let me take that back and work on that. We micromanage. You've never seen micromanagement at a medical school, have you? You see, not at our school. <laughs> there went the believable part, right? So, but it's really hard to let somebody fail. It's hard to let somebody tank and face plant sometimes. But you have to. Sometimes you have to do that uh, for two reasons. One, that they knew that you trusted them to do it. And two, uh, that if they're going to fail, they'll fail on their own merit and they have to drag in. That doesn't mean that you don't revisit it. You say, all right, 
that was a good idea to spoil a lot of facts. So let's try again. How would we redo this a second time? Let's take another run at it. We failed at this. Now we incorporated X in the curriculum and it sucked. The students hated it. So it's a good idea. Didn't go off very well as we think. And I, I don't think we do that very often. We don't let people fail. So let me ask you, what do you think of your cause? Oh my God, 
X. Look, we need to repaint the gym floor. It's really bad. Do something about it. And so we'll wait and see, right? We'll wait and see if the gym floor really needs it. We'll wait and see if we get money for the gym floor. We'll wait and see for this, that, or another. Instead, you can go back and say, well, tell you what. You're right. We probably do. Give me three courses of action that we would do. What, what happens if we, A, put off paying the gym floor? B, uh, we work it into this year's budget. Or C, we do it X. So now I've, I've turned it around where you brought the problem, but now I've empowered you to help create the solution. And, but I've given you, how many, you know, how many of you have kids again? So you've, you've got the small kids, right? When you give, when you tell the kids, you give them a decision, do you make it an open question? Do you say, what would you like to wear today? Or do you say, would you like the blue shirt or the red shirt? Right? So, yeah, exactly. You are going to wear clothes whether you like it or not. But you, so, in some respects, you're empowering them, but you're not empowering them completely. But you're empowering them enough to where they feel they're empowered and they are not just shut down with their good idea. Um, and then you have to follow up on it. Because then when they bring you the three courses of action, you're going to have to follow one of them. might not be the one they like, but at least it's one of the three that they brought you. Sometimes that's tough for folks to do too. Some, you know, might be one of the, not one of the directions you want to go. But sometimes you have to pick your battles. You think, all right, if I really want to have a pissing match with him over the gym floor, eh, probably not. I, really don't, I don't really care about the gym floor necessarily. Um, so then, you know, then I'll find something I'm passionate about that I need your help on. A, remember, we, we did a great job on that gym floor. Have I got a deal for you? Bring in. So, and just using those techniques. On that note, let's go.